Some snakes have too heat sensitive patches of skin on the side of their head, and so do infrared homing air to air missiles. The difference? Infrared homing air to air missiles have just one sensor. Coming up. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Today we are talking about infrared homing, which is probably the most common homing system adopted by air-to-air -air missiles. But before I start, please take a second to just subscribe or hit the bell so you won't miss any episode of this series. What is inside an infrared homing air-to-air -air missile? Well, they're no different than any other missiles. You have a propulsion section, which is normally a rocket engine, a control section, an armament section, the warhead, and the guidance section. And for those who wanted to see me actually cut a side window like a salami, well, um, guys, I'm sorry, you will have to make do with the animation. The guidance laws for infrared radar homing missiles are no different from the guidance laws that we have already seen for other different types of missiles with a different technology. You can refer to the previous videos if you are really interested about that. I will put the link somewhere here on top. In general, we can say that a missile can try to pursue the target with a pursuit guidance law, or will try to predict the impact point with a proportional navigation law. Please note that infrared homing, unlike the other types of guidance that somehow involve a radar, can tell the distance to the target. So those sophisticated laws that minimize the energy spent to get to the target are more difficult to apply. For us who live in the era of smartphones, it is sort of natural to think that the missile sensor is not dissimilar from the sensor in, that we have in our smartphones. The guidance is provided by a digital computer that applies image recognition algorithms uh, just to identify the target. And yes, that's exactly what happens with the most recent generation of weapons like the AIM-9X or the Iris-T or the ASRAM. You always have to remember that the weapons that we are using today go through development cycles that may last even decades, so the technology that they use may be two or three generations behind the corresponding civil technology. While photographic sensors working in the visible part of the spectrum can be manufactured by silicon, to have really efficient infrared sensor, you need to use more exotic materials. Indium antimonide, mercury, cadmium, telluride, indium, gallium, arsenide, vanadium oxide. The sensors built with these materials are known as focal plane arrays. They are basically a complex sandwich of this exotic material and silicon with a circuitry to transport some of the electrical properties of the crystals to the measurement circuitry. Fact is that most of these materials are sensitive to the infrared only if they are cooled to cryogenic temperature, because otherwise the infrared noise of the sensor actually maxes out the sensor itself. So the missile requires a mechanism to cool the array, which is normally in the form of a reservoir of cryogenic liquid. Depending on the weapon, there are different technical solutions. The most common one is having the pylon host this mechanism and actually restoring the reserve of a cryogenic coolant is one of the parts of the rearmament process. Some other planes, like the F-14, have an onboard facility for the production of the coolant. Some weapons have the coolant on board to simplify the integration and the rearming process. Less common, but very effective, are the Peltier electric coolers, which are basically just electric. So as long as the missile is connected to the power, it will work and it will greatly simplify all the logistic chain to keep the missile working. 
These sensors are normally mounted on the focal plane of the lens, which is necessary to form an image on it, basic optics. And the mechanism is mounted on a gimbal to have an overall larger field of view. Ideally, you want a magnifier lens to acquire the target at longer distances, but the more you magnify, the narrower is the field of view. So, target acquisition becomes more difficult and it crucially becomes easier for the target to try to get out of the field of view of the missile. Therefore, the sensors are mounted on a gimbal to let the sensor scan the largest portion of sky in front of it. For this reason, the term instantaneous field of view is often used to identify the field of view of the assembly lens plus sensor and the term off-bore sight is used to identify uh, the field of view of the complex of the lens plus the gimbal. Modern missiles like the AIM-9X have an off-bore sight capability up to 90 degrees. The sensor is laid to a helmet mounted sight so the pilot just need to turn his head toward the target. In this case, the missile acquires the target and just after the launch executes a hard turn toward the target, obviously always according to the guidance laws. If you have seen my previous video, you will already know that a maneuver like this will bleed a lot of energy so it will be reserved in dogfight situations uh, where distances are very very close. It is a bit difficult to understand why the air forces of the world keep pursuing these high offboard side capabilities while they keep declaring that stealth and modern long-range missiles can operate beyond visual range have made dogfight obsolete. Yeah, but this is a subject for a different video, maybe. The first generation of imaging systems used a contrast-based uh, algorithm to track the target, the same that was in use with the first TV-guided bombs. Basically, the seeker kept tracking a high contrast point on the image, and that was supposed to be the target. Full stop. As soon as the technology progressed, the seekers actually became capable of recognizing the image of the target itself and even identifying the most vulnerable part of it. Another benefit is that imaging systems are much, much more resistant to what? Another benefit is that imaging based systems are much more resistant to simple countermeasures like the flares, but are also way less easily fooled by sun reflections or the sun itself. Tactics normally don't get a lot of publicity, but we can definitely say something on how these weapons are used in actual combat. The pilot identifies the target, points the missile sensor toward the target either by a helmet mounted sight, in the most modern cases, or by pointing the whole plane toward it. The missile sensor acquires the target and then the missile is fired. Since the pilot needs to see the target, obviously these weapons are used just within visual range. However, most modern infrared radar homing missiles may have kinematically the capacity to engage targets beyond visual range. Normally this capacity is not used, but for planes that have an infrared search and track that could actually extend the queuing enough to use the weapon beyond visual range. Obviously, there's no need to say that most modern missiles are all aspects, so they can attack a target from back, from up, from in front, because they lock on the infrared emission of the heated skin of the plane. Obviously, the pilot needs to have cooled the missile sensor before entering the battle, and sometimes this is a factor because the cooling may last 30 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour, 
and at some point you may run out of coolant. And finally, crucially, these weapons are true fire and forget weapons. Once the missile is launched, no input from the plane is needed. Obviously, the probability of the missile hitting the target doesn't depend only from the quality of the lock, but also from the kinematics of the engagement. Since the calculation of all the parameters is too difficult to be left to the pilot, then the onboard computer normally provides assistance. The pilot will be given a video cue on the head-up display, or uh, sometimes it is just an audio cue, for example, the famous growling of the sidewinder. The most recent versions of the Western missiles actually implement also a data link and a lock-on after launch mode. This is useful for two reasons. The first is that in this way an extreme of boresite angles are possible. Eventually it is also possible what is called the launch over the shoulder where the missile does 180 degrees turn and tries to hit whatever is chasing the launcher. The second, and probably the most relevant, is the fact that with the use of a data link, the missile that actually have a very long range uh, can make full use of it, can try to kinematically engage targets that are flying beyond the visual range, and also, crucially, they can make use of those complex control laws that optimize the energy used. To be honest, on this subject, different countries may have different doctrines, but again, this is a subject for a different video. In this video, I actually focused on the most modern technology, but the history of infrared weather homing is really, really interesting and is a real history of ingenuity and brilliant ideas. If you're interested, please let me know in the comments below because we may want to do a video dedicated to that. Now, for the moment being, if you like this video, please like it. If you are that kind of person, you can also dislike it, but please remember to subscribe and hit the bell. Anyway, whatever your choice, thank you for watching and goodbye.